Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. <sighs> Pray for laborers. It's a theme. It says, Then said he unto his disciples, he being our Lord Jesus Christ, the harvest is truly what? Plenteous. But the laborers are few. He now gives the solution. He says, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Thank you, Father. The first thing he says is that there is a harvest. He says the harvest is plenteous. It alludes to the fact that there is harvest. Now that is good and bad news. Depending on which side of the divide you belong. There is a harvest is good news if your seeds are good. But there is a harvest is bad news if your seeds are bad. Because each harvest is according to the seed. So you must live knowing that there is a harvest. Live with a harvest time mindset. Knowing that everything you do, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will not cease. So that house help that you are maltreating, there is a harvest coming. That your staff, that you are torturing and refusing to bless, even though God is prospering you, even though you know the person is working diligently, there is a harvest. Those are people's children. You also have children. Live knowing that there is a harvest. Do good knowing that there is a harvest. If you live with a harvest mindset, you will be a blessing wherever you go so that there will be a blessing for you everywhere you go because there is a harvest. Let's learn to live with this knowledge. Live with this mindset that everything I do is a seed I'm sowing for a harvest. So when somebody greets you and you turn away from the person, know there is a harvest waiting for you. If you have an opportunity to bless somebody and you turn it down, know there is a harvest waiting for you. Just live with that mindset. Jesus said the harvest is plenteous. The harvest is plenty, but it alludes to the fact that there is a harvest. So everywhere I go, I ought to be a blessing. Everyone who encounters me ought to live with a good taste in their mouth. Because there is a harvest. The person you are insulting, there is a harvest waiting that's the first thing you must know. But he said the harvest is plenteous. But the laborers are few. I love the way the Lord Jesus starts with the good part, the harvest. He didn't start with the problem, laborers are few. He starts with the good news. There is a harvest. Then he says the laborers are few. But he didn't leave us with a problem. I don't like people bringing problems to me. Bring me solutions. I have enough of problems. People telling me the problems. Come with solutions. We have a problem maybe with this water situation. Come to me with a solution. Don't come to me and say, ah, Pastor, this water now, wow, what is I, I already know. Exactly. You are not telling me news. Come and say, Pastor, I have a solution. Now I want to listen to you. The Lord Jesus brings a solution. But he says the laborers are few. And God said to me, picture this. If you, have, if you stand in a place... Let's say the whole of VGC is a vegetation land for me to farm. And somebody says, Emeka, you are going to farm this land for me. I say, okay. And he gives me four people. And I look back and I see four people. And I look back and I see that there are only four plus me, five, for this whole place. How do you react? The laborers are few. And God said to me, some will react by sitting down and saying, well, <laughs> there's no way we're going to do this. So the best thing, let's just surrender before we start. There's no point getting into this. Just like the man that was giving one talent. He said, there's nothing I can do with this, I beg. He buried it and left. There's another way you can react. You can react by saying, well, we're only five. Let's take a small portion and just do that small portion and know that at least we have done. You should change yourself. But you can also say, let's go and do all of it. And then you get burnt out. You get tired because you can't cover all. 
But he gives the solution. He says, pray for laborers. He says, do what? He says, pray. Pray for them to come in. What does this mean, please? And this is, this, there's a burning in my heart over this because of the things that the Lord shared with me this morning. What does this mean? When you are overwhelmed, pray. Harvest is plenteous, laborers are few. That's an overwhelming situation. Where do I start from? When you are overwhelmed, pray. When you face more than you can handle, pray. When the people that are ganged up against you are bigger than you can imagine, get into the place of prayer and pray. That's what he's saying. When you don't have enough, I don't have enough manpower to handle this. He says, pray. Don't sweat it. Pray. Don't call a committee. Pray. Don't start to strategize. Pray first. You don't have, you have insufficient funds. He says, pray. What I have is inadequate. Pray. Not complain. Not complain that the laborers are few. He already said that. Oh, now what for this labor? No, no, no. We complain too much. Complaining is not the same thing as praying. He says, pray. Don't complain. You need helpers. That's what it means. Laborers are few. I need helpers. You need helpers. Do what? Pray. Not go and look for them. He says, pray. He said to me, to advance in life's affairs, you must take advantage of God's invitation to pray. To advance in the affairs of life, I must take advantage of God's invitation to pray. This is an invitation from God. He's saying, pray. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest. Who is the Lord of the harvest? That's the almighty God himself. He says, pray to me. I know laborers are few, but if you will cry out to me, brethren, he's inviting you to pray. He's inviting me to pray. I love Psalm 2 verse 8. Psalm 2 verse 8. Oh my goodness. This scripture, he says, ask of me and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. What is the condition? Ask of me. Again, he's saying pray. To give you the heathen. The heathen are like the enemies. He's saying, I'll put the enemy under you if you will pray. I will put the enemy under your control if you will pray. To say uttermost part means the, the ones that are outside your reach. If you will pray. Look, nothing is out of the reach of the one who will pray. Because the one who will pray is summoning the everlasting arms to go on his behalf. You had the testimonies here this morning of people who prayed. Oh, I prayed and this is what happened. I came to the altar and I prayed and God turned it. I prayed and God gave me visa. We came to the altar and we prayed and God turned the heart of the lecturer who said my son will not graduate. If we will pray. Prayer is the place. Pray. Prayer is the place where you make the impossible possible. If we will pray. He says, ask of me. This is God giving you a blank check. He says, ask of me. I will give you. The heathen for your inheritance. Strangers will serve you if you will pray. That's the heathen. They are strangers. He says if you will pray. In other words, if I don't pray, I am limiting my inheritance. I am the one limiting. He said, I will give you the uttermost part. I will give you heathen for your inheritance. So if I won't ask of him, I won't get the inheritance. If you will pray. Expansion comes by prayer. If you are running a business... Strategy is good. Meetings are good. Good employees are good. But brethren, you must pray to expand. It's not negotiable. You pray if you want to expand. Supplication comes before possession. That child that is like a heathen, that child that will not serve God, that child that is far, that seems to have gone far from God, uttermost parts of the earth, if you will pray, if you will ask, God will bring him. God said to me this morning to take prayer lightly is to take this devil as friendly. To take prayer lightly is to esteem the devil as a friend of yours. You think Satan has mercy? No. If I will pray, where are the praying men, where are the praying women of these times? Where are those who hold on to the horns of the altar and not let go? Where are those who will pray and the ground will move? Psalm 50 verse 15. Another call to prayer. Psalm 50 verse 15 says, And call upon me in the day of trouble. My goodness. Who's saying this? 
God is saying, call upon me in which day? In the day of trouble. And what will I do? I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. You see, God is not afraid of trouble. In fact, trouble is afraid of God. He says, in the day of trouble, bring it. In the day of trouble, bring it to me. Call upon me in the day of trouble. What he's telling us is that you are not immune from trouble. I am not immune from trouble. As long as I'm on this earth, troubles will show up. Whether troubles in the office, troubles from family members, troubles will show up. But the man of prayer, the woman of prayer is not subject to troubles. You may not be immune to troubles, but you are not subject to it. They can come. In fact, troubles are promotions wrapped. That's how they are. It's wrapped. It's promotion that has been wrapped. It comes as trouble. But to a man of prayer, you unwrap it in the place of prayer and it becomes promotion. As the three Hebrew boys who entered fire, they came out promoted. As Daniel, who was thrown into the lion's den, he came out promoted. It bursts promotion to the one who will pray. As Jehoshaphat, he had trouble. He came out promoted. He came out with increase. He was collecting goodies for three days that he didn't pay for. He didn't fight for. Why? Because he prayed. He called on God in the day of trouble. God answered him. That's what it is. If you will pray, you will convert troubles to promotion. That's why he said, I will give you double for trouble. So that thing that the enemy does not want me to have, that he has brought to fight, that Emeka, you won't have this. In the place of prayer, I take double. They were going to promote me, and he said, Emeka, they can't promote you. He brought trouble, brought contention, brought petition. I took those petitions to the altar, and I said, Papa, this is going on. I call upon you, Jehovah. When the thing, the dust settles, I get double promotion. The contract was a billion, and Satan said it's not going to happen. And they began to query, began to refuse, began to reject, and papers started flying. And I brought it to the altar. I said, Baba, no way. And I stayed up at night, praying and crying out to God, day on end, night on end. In the end, the dust settles. And they said, sorry, we shall change you. The contract was supposed to be two billion. It's no longer one billion. Come and take the contract. That's double for the trouble. But it's for the one who will pray. It's for the one who will tarry in the place of prayer. It's not for anybody. It's not for everybody. He said, call upon me. He didn't say sweat. He didn't say have sleepless nights. He didn't say complain. What did he say? Call upon me. He didn't say go to court. He said, call upon me. Court is our attempt to take the back door to get what God promised you. Oh, I go to God. Go to God. Take it to the court of heaven. We are going to Supreme Court. What is Supreme Court before the court of heaven? If we will pray. <laughs> Not give them a piece of your mind. He said, call upon me. Call upon me. He's waiting. Bring it. Is there trouble, Emeka? Bring it to me. I got you. Call on to me. Not stay awake all night worrying like many of us do. When troubles show up, instead of sleeping, you will stay awake worrying. Why don't you stay awake praying? You are awake thinking, oh, my uncle can help me. This other person can help me. You are wasting time. You are burning daylight. He says, call upon me in the day of trouble. He didn't say this kind of trouble. Now, doctors have special this kind of trouble. Now, doctors have specialties. Even people in accounting, they have their specialty. This one has their specialty. God said, call upon me in the day of trouble. Any kind of is it marital trouble? Call upon me. Is it financial trouble? Call upon me. Is it health challenge? Call upon me. He says any one of them, call upon me, I am able. He's master of all. I'll give you the double. You see, trouble can take you up or down. Trouble is like an elevator. An elevator can take you up or take you down. It depends on which button you press. Now, prayer is the way you press the up button. So that that trouble takes you up instead of taking you down. But refusal to pray means you have automatically, inadvertently, by default, press the down button and trouble will take you down. But if I engage in the place of prayer, when trouble shows up, I press the up button and that, like elevator, it takes me up. I will deliver, God said. It's an assurance. He didn't say, I will try my best to deliver you. No. He said, I will. He didn't, he didn't say, well, let me see how I can deliver you. He said, I will. 
Your key to your deliverance is your calling. Your calling on God is the key to deliverance. In other words, if you won't call, you have rejected deliverance. If you won't cry out to God, you have rejected, you have made trouble your abode. I will stay in the trouble. That's what you do when you refuse to call on God. In other words, the sooner you call, the sooner you get out. Can you say that with me? Yeah, that's what it means. If he says, call upon me and I will deliver you. In other words, the sooner I call, the sooner I come out of that trouble. Those, he said to me, those who will tarry long will not have to suffer long. Those who will tarry long will not have to suffer long. And he said, I will glorify. Thou shalt glorify me. Those who will pray will never lack reason to glorify God. Those who will pray. Listen to in Luke 18 verse 1. In beginning the parable of it, that they talk about the woman uh, about importunity in prayer. Luke 18:1. The Bible says men ought the Bible says men ought always to pray and not to men ought always how often always to pray. Prayer is not supposed to be a habit, it's supposed to be a habitat. It's where you live. It's where you are. It's where you are. It's who you are. That's the way to, to it. For a child of God, it's supposed to be that way is where I am. Whether in trouble, he says men ought to pray always. There is no trouble, there is peace around men ought to pray always. There is sorrow, men ought to pray always. There is no sorrow, men ought to pray. I am happy, men ought to pray. I'm at home, men ought to pray. I'm at the office, men ought to pray. I'm on vacation, men ought to pray. I'm in the UK, men ought to pray. I'm in the US, men ought to pray. I'm in church, men ought to pray. I'm in my car, men ought to pray. I'm in the bus, men ought to pray. I'm walking, men ought to pray. You live to pray, you pray to live. It's an attitude of fellowship. Consistent communion with God. Men who will pray. That's how you stay sober and stay vigilant in these times. But it's a choice. You have a choice to pray or to faint. He says men ought to pray and not. So there's a choice between praying and fainting. Fainting is being in despair, getting tired, getting depressed, getting sorrowful, bowing your head in shame. That's fainting. And boy, where would you find those who are fainting in church? God calls them to pray, but they are fainted. Oh, pastor, I'm so depressed. You are fainted. He said, pray. Pastor, I'm tired of life. You are fainted. He said, pray. Do not faint. What, let what the enemy brings. Listen to this, please. That which the enemy brings, whether it's a letter, whether it's a demolition mark on your property, that which the enemy brings to cause you to go in despair and faint, let that same document become your summons into the secret place. Let that be an invitation letter into the secret place. They brought it to threaten you. They brought it to weaken you. They brought it to make you bow. Take that thing and say, Baba, this is your invitation for me. I'm entering the secret place with you. Let it be your summons. God said to me, those people of the closet are never clueless. People of the closet are never clueless. You will not find them clueless. Ask Daniel. There was never a point where Daniel was clueless. People of the closet. First Timothy 2, it's a man ought to pray. I will that men pray everywhere with their hands lifted up, without wrath or doubting. Everywhere. Do not be ashamed to pray. Everywhere. Your vocation as a child of God is prayer, primarily. Prayer. So don't let your location take away your vocation as a child of God. Oh, but I'm in a restaurant. So, you pray. 
Are you ashamed to let them know you are a child of God? You pray. Some people made a joke and said, well, that many people do not pray as they used to pray in Nigeria when they relocate abroad. That they become lukewarm. They get, and that the reason is because everything is working over there. Light is there 24-7. Water is available. Security is available. Fire brigade, if you call them, they show up. Not the one that they will tell you they are looking for water here. For the one year, they are still looking for water. You haven't seen them. And all such things. And so many people feel that there is really no need and everything. And they get lukewarm. And I ask, please, is the devil less wicked in UK than he is in Nigeria? Is the devil less wicked in the US than he is in Nigeria? Is the devil more wicked in Africa than he is outside the country? The devil is wicked wherever you go. The devil does not have split personality. He's wicked. He's out to steal, to kill, to destroy. Yeah, water may be there. Light may be there. This may be there. But that won't stop the devil from attacking you. You. So your location does not mean, oh, well, relax. All is well now. As long as the devil is still there. Stop fooling around with ignorance. Jeremiah 33, 3, another scripture I love so much. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call unto me, and I will answer you. Then I will show. <laughs> I will answer, and I will show. That's God. You want answer? He said, call. You want God to show? He said, call. The almighty God puts himself at your back and call. With that statement, he said, call. I will answer you. I will show you. That is an invitation. That is God saying, I'm here for you. If only you will call. Can you not see the foolishness of prayerlessness? If the king of glory, the almighty, the creator of all things, the one before whom nothing is impossible, says, if you call on me, I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. And then you refuse to pray. He said, call unto me. He didn't say, fill forms. He didn't say, pay your bills and I will show up. Buy your ticket and then I can come and I will show you. Pay my fees, my consultancy fees and I will show up for you. No. What did he say to do? Call upon him. Not book an appointment. Call upon him. Not see your pastor. Call upon him. Not look for a prophet. Call upon him. He said, call unto me. He didn't say, if I'm less busy, I will attend to you. No, he said, call unto me and I will answer you. He didn't say, if I'm available, then I will, I will answer you. He said, call unto me and I will answer you. He didn't say, I will do it as soon as possible. He said, call unto me and I will answer you. I will answer. No wonder blind Bartimaeus called. And Jesus answered. He called. He had said it in Jeremiah 33. Three. The man took it and began to call Jesus, that son of David. He answered him. What is keeping you from calling, Biko? What is keeping you? Do you know when he answers, you become a custodian of the answer. When God answers you, you become a custodian of the answer. And can I tell you something? Those who are custodian of answers cannot be ignored in life. Kings are looking for people who have the answer. Presidents are looking for people who have the answer. God said he will answer you. He will give you the answer. That's why Daniel, Joseph was someone quickly before Pharaoh. He had the answer. Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar, he had the answer. They were looking for somebody to interpret what was written on the wall. They said that there's a man that always has the answer. They sought out Daniel. Four different kings came. None of them decided that I'm going to fire Daniel. They kept him. Why? He had the answer. The answer is the reason that you will have longevity. Even in ministry. In whatever endeavor, if you have the answer, you will have longevity. Today, people show up like a blaze of glory and they disappear. Because they don't have the answer. God said he will give you the answer. People can't ignore you when he gives you the answer. Huh? And we forfeit it. God said if you won't persist, Satan won't desist. If you will not persist, Satan will not desist. In other words, he will continue to do what he's doing if you refuse to do what you are supposed to do. 
If you won't persist, the problem will persist. It is called the law of inverse persistence. That's what the Lord called it. The law of inverse persistence. If I won't persist, then the problem will persist. But if I persist, then the problem will have to go. It can't persist. That's why Hannah prayed the way she prayed. She persisted and said, no way, I'm not leaving Shiloh till something happens. The problem ended. Other times she will come to Shiloh, do one simple prayer and go. Do one simple prayer and go. This time she said, no, 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 no. If you think I'm a mad woman, I don't care. But I'm going to persist because this thing has to stop. Blind Bartimaeus persisted. They said, shut up, he persisted. People who just want to do touch and go prayers with God. <laughs> Not these days. Listen to Isaiah 62. 6 and 7. These are sweet scriptures. Isaiah 62, 6 and 7 says, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem. <laughs> Where are the watchmen? Those who refuse. Those who refuse to sleep. Those who are not sleeping when other men are sleeping. Those who are not held captive by their beds. They are the watchmen. Which shall never hold their peace day nor night. <laughs> Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not and give him no rest till he establish, till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Your refusal to pray is your resignation to your situation. In other words, you have decided this is okay for me. If you refuse to pray. Because he says, don't give me rest till you have all you want. Do you remember when Abraham met with the Lord, three of them, and began to intercede on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah? Do you realize that God did not stop giving till Abraham stopped asking? As long as Abraham would say, oh, can you do it for 50? What if 50? I would say, okay, 50, no problem. Okay, uh, sorry, sir. What if, if there are 45 people? 45, no problem. W sorry, sir. What if, if there are 40? 40. As long as Abraham kept asking, God kept yielding to him. It was until he stopped at 10 that God stopped. Who knows if he had gone to 5 or gone to 1? And God would have spared for one. And there was one, Lord. But he didn't get there. So when you resign and look at your place and you refuse to, play, refuse to pray, you have decided this is okay for me. This is where I should stay. That's not contentment. That's complacency. In fact, a few weeks ago, my wife and I were reading a book and God told us and said, you guys have confused contentment for complacency. And so this morning when I was praying, I said, Lord, what is contentment? What is complacency? He said, contentment is staying grateful for the possession while pressing forward diligently for the promise. Staying grateful for the possession while pressing forward diligently for the promised. That's contentment. I'm grateful where I am, but I'm not stopping here. I'm pressing forward. What is complacency? Forfeiting the promise for the possessed. What you have now, you just say, well, let's leave it there. But there is a promise ahead that you are refusing to go and possess. Oh, we prayed yesterday. So, that means don't pray today. Oh, pastor, I've been praying. Yeah, pray without. So the Bible says, remember the king that struck three times and stopped. And the prophet said, ah, look at you. Look at you. Did I tell you to stop? Why did he stop? He assumed he has done enough. And the prophet said, look at you. You, you. you would have defeated these people continuously till you finish them off. Now you're only going to defeat them three times. 
That the judge said if he was the man, he would start hitting again. But the man didn't even do again. Complacency. He said, well, three times. It's okay. We defeated them. No, eh? And that's what he got. We slacken in the place of prayer. Pray without ceasing. Samuel said it would be a sin when they were telling him to please the children of Israel. Please don't stop praying for us. He said, I won't commit a sin by ceasing to pray for you. Do you know that you owe it to your destiny to pray? You owe it to the destiny of your children to pray. You owe it to the destiny of your spouse to stand in the gap for that person. You owe it. Generations yet unborn that are coming after you are going to have to fight battles that you refuse to fight because of complacency in the place of prayer. Because of thinking, underestimating the power of prayer. And thereby undermining the authority of God. Some children are fighting battles in prayer and all that that they are toiling with today because their parents did not do it. Why don't you end it in your place and say none of my children will fight this? It's going to end. I've made up my mind. I'm not passing any battle, any generational contention to my children. Except for generational blessings. But it doesn't come by mouth. You have to stand in the place of prayer. The prayer closet is the incubating room for breakthroughs. It's where you incubate breakthroughs. Lord said to me, till the Till every venture in life becomes an adventure in prayer, you won't go far. Let me say that again. He said to me this morning, till every venture in life becomes an adventure in prayer, you won't go far. That's the Lord. So whether I'm running a business, that venture has to become an adventure in prayer. Whether I'm going to school, I'm a student. That venture has to become an adventure in the place of prayer. Whether I'm in politics, that venture has to become an adventure in prayer for me to go far. Otherwise, you are limited. Cease not to pray for you. Pray without ceasing. When you cease praying, the enemy has been authorized to seize your property. Do you know, Israel did not emerge until Peniel. Israel was covered in Jacob. The glory, Israel. The story, Jacob. It was all story till that night at Peniel when Jacob decided, no. My glory has to be born. The Bible said he wrestled all night. With an angel. He refused. He tarried. He held on. He said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. That was when Israel emerged. Brethren, if we will not emerge, it is better right. But when you refuse to pray, you are despising your destiny. And whatever you despise, you lose. Destiny. And whatever you despise, you lose. And many people have lost their destiny. The closet prevail in the affairs of life. There is a prevailing. Secret place with place so that you can prevail in the marketplace. Secret place so that you can prevail in the marketplace. Prayer is not only for pastors and ministers, prayer is for every child of God. Prayer is for all of us. Whatever your venture is, prayer is for you. Can you go to your business at night after everybody has locked up and they've gone? You step into that place and go on your knees in that office and you stay there till daybreak. Crying out to God that this business must be recession proof. That's what you do. You, you, are, you can't afford to do what the world is doing. You can't bribe the way they bribe. You can't follow people the way they follow. You can't go to the covens that they go to. You can't go to the native doctors they go to. Then you have your own altar. Raise an altar in your office. After the workers have gone, you send them away. Go, just like Jacob did, and have a penal night in your office. By yourself, you and God. I say, Baba, things must change. Not to take prayer seriously is to take life lightly. You underestimate the power of prayer. You have undermined the authority of God. 
Some people think prayer is unnecessary. They have actually thought their success unimportant. Oh, now today pray. Okay. You be playing. They play. Now today pray. If you will not endure in the place of prayer, you will endure in the affairs of life. And some people, your name ought to be called endurance now. Because you won't endure in the place of prayer. Now you're having to endure insults, endure disgrace, endure all sorts of mockery, endure reproach because you won't endure in the place of prayer. My mommy is praying for me. <laughs> they play. Mommy. The prayer closet is the place where you make impossible things possible. It's the place where you undo what the enemy has done. It's the place where you predetermine tomorrow while tomorrow is still in the womb of yesterday. It's in the place of prayer you predetermine what is going to be. You decree it in the place of prayer. You only come out to see it. Some people choose the path of passivity when it comes to prayer. They are just passive about it. You have already been led into captivity without knowing it when you choose passivity in the place of prayer. The most ignorant of men is the one who believes the solution to his or her problem is in the hands of man. That's the most ignorant of men living. The one who believes ah, the solution is in the hand of man. If I can only see the president, if I can only see minister, if I can only see the governor, if I can only see this, my problem will end. You are foolish. The solution is in whose hands? It's in the hand of God. The Lord said to me, if you take the back seat in the place of prayer, Satan will take the driving seat in your life. If you take the back seat in the place of prayer, Satan will take the driving seat in your life. If you read the book of Acts, you will see how they killed James. Herod took James and killed him. And people were celebrating. Then he went and said, well, since I've pleased them, political, whatever, you know how it is with politics. Let me also get Peter and kill. Since already my position, my, my polling results are getting good with this one that I killed. He took Peter. But the Bible says prayer was made continuously for Peter. The church prayed continuously for Peter. They did not stop praying for Peter. And Peter... An angel came, woke Peter up in the prison, in the dungeon, in the middle of the night. Woke Peter up, put on your clothes. Peter was sleeping. Chains fell off his feet. The angel led him through the quarter names, through the army. Army, they were sleeping or they were awake, but they, they were paralyzed. They couldn't do anything. Got to the gate. The gate opened on its own accord. Angel took Peter to where the church was praying for him. Because the church prayed continuously. Why did James die? The church was not praying as the auto. And James was killed. It wasn't that it was God's will that James must die at that time. No. He failed in their responsibility. And that's what happens when we fail in our responsibility to pray. You have given the enemy right to do. If things must change, you must engage the weapon of prayer. If things must change. People just come and say, ah, Pastor, things must change, things must change. Yeah, things must change. But you are going to have to engage in the place of prayer. You are going to have to engage. Stop praying Mickey Mouse prayers. Plus God minus devil, amen. Mickey Mouse, get up. Stop hugging the bed. A man of God said he kept sleeping when he woke up to pray. And he said, what am I going to do? I can't pray. I keep sleeping off. And he decided, okay, there's something I can do. He got up and said that night he went to stand by the edge of his bath in the bathroom. I said, okay, Jerry, if you sleep here, you know it is heaven you'll wake up. So let us see you sleep. Eyes were like this, awake. Desperate times calls for desperate actions. You engage prayer. People are just saying, I want things to change. They say, that delay will persist until you persist in the place of prayer. Those battles will persist until you persist in the room in the place of prayer. The 
Greatness is born in the place of groaning. That's where it's born. Hmm. Oh, thank you, Lord. The Lord said to me this morning again, he said, those who joke with, the, with their prayer life are real life clowns. Those who joke with their prayer life are real life clowns. And brethren, we have many real life clowns in the church. Pray you put your hand in your pocket. You are talking to your houseboy. Lord, you know, uh, it's all right. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. You have spoken to Emeka, your servant, to go and deliver it. No. My son called me, one of my sons called me yesterday. I shared a testimony with me. And I wanted to pray two quick prayer points. He said to me, many years ago, he said, Daddy, I don't know if I ever told you this, and he never did. Many years ago, when my wife became pregnant for her son, they told her, after checking all the things they checked, and they said, the boy has Down's syndrome. You are going to have to abort the baby. Otherwise, you are going to have a child with Down syndrome. And that's not a good thing. And so they kept waiting for him to decide. And they kept saying, time is drawing near. It's getting close. There is a limit to when we can do it. If he passes that period, that gestation period, we may not be, whatever period they gave him, we will not be able to do it again. So you need to decide. He said the decision was upon him. He didn't know what to do. And then one night, after the workers' prayer meeting, the time we used to have our workers' prayer meeting, Mondays, Wednesdays, Friday, he was in the Friday group. He said they did their Friday prayer 9 to 11. And him and his wife entered the main auditorium. We used to do it in the teens' church. And they climbed on top of the altar. The wife lay her belly there. He lay flat. And he said to God, Lord, if indeed this altar was raised in your name. Then let this altar speak for this boy. That was all he prayed. And he left that place. And when he left, he told them, no operation, she will give birth to the child. They said, are you sure? He said, yes, I'm sure. Three different doctors gave the diagnosis, so it's not just one. Three. He said, including one abroad. He said, it's Down syndrome. They gave birth to the child. <laughs> I said, the God we serve. The reason you are not seeing miracles is because you are not engaging in the place of prayer. You are taking prayer lightly and you are taking your life lightly. Things, anything can change at any time. This boy was born. No, he said, if I see this boy quoting scriptures. If I see this boy praying. He's just five. If I see him praying. He's the one who's saying, Daddy, let's go to church. Let's go to church. I said, no wonder the devil was after his destiny. But they went to God in prayer. When are you going to go to God in prayer? When are you going to have your own perennial experience? When are you going to hold on to God till something gives way? When are you going to hold on to God? When are you going to say, no, I'm not going in. I'm not coming out till something changes. I'm not coming out till my name changes. I'm not coming out till this situation changes. I'm not coming out till answer comes. When? When? The bed may have been, become the worst invention that Satan gave to us. <laughs> And with every breathing in and snoring out, Satan is gaining advantage over us. By morning, they've already decreed what will happen through the day. While you were sleeping, they have settled your destiny for the day. Then you wake up and pray one Mickey Mouse prayer and you get on the road. And then you say, Pastor, I don't know what happened though. Yeah, I was there. How will you know what happened? You were sleeping while men slept. Rise up on your feet. And if there's a church that organizes opportunities to pray, 
It is Jesus' embassy. We are always doing one thing or the other to pray. This to pray. That to pray. But where are you? <laughs> Sleeping, somebody said. Sleeping. Dozing away. Or pursuing money. I had a meeting. I need to pursue money. If you will pray, money will pursue you. There are people who are praying and they are pursuing them with appointments that you are pursuing, running from Sokoto to Kaduna to this to that. There are people who pray. They, one of my sons had that a few years ago. They called him to give him an appointment as a commissioner in Lagos State. He came to meet me and said, ah, I don't know, I didn't, I'm not a politician. I'm not a this, I don't know why they are reaching me this. I said, that's the way it is. But he turned it down. He said, I don't want. Meanwhile, there are people who would have been sleeping all night at the governor's door. At this person's door, bringing this, bringing that, uh, kissing this other one, giving this one kick back, kick front, kick side, kick to get it. They are calling somebody who is not even a politician, who is not interested, who says no. You are begging, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Come to me, God said. Let me give you. He's got an inheritance for you, but you've got to pray. I've been praying. Pray without. Don't stop. Don't give him rest till your joy is full. I owe it to my children to pray for them. It will be a sin for me as a father to sit and watch Satan ruin their destinies. I will stand in the gap and say, Satan, this one you can't. You can't. I refuse to let you have a hand in what is going on in their lives. I didn't come to you to give me these children. So you don't have a right to tamper with their destiny. I will stand in the gap for as long as it will take. So Satan better be ready for the battle you are getting into. And that's when I, what I tell him when he shows up in some certain ways. I say, Satan, you better be ready for what you are showing up for. Because if you step into this arena, one person is going down and it is you. I'm assuring you in the name of Jesus. My daughter said, Daddy, when do you now sleep? I said, my dear, sleep is overrated. I'm not saying don't sleep. I sleep too. But men, there are some times when I decide, sleep? Yes, ma'am. Push it aside. I say, no. Tonight, we have got to settle some things. We traveled a few days ago. Thank God, the hotel wasn't very convenient. And it was good. It was good. Because it kept me off the bed. So I had a long space because it was a suite to march up and down and pray all night. Good. Nobody disturbing me with phone calls. Me and God alone. By the time you do that and you sit down in the early mornings, God will begin to give you answers. Better hold your pen and he will begin to tell you, write this, do this, submit this. This is a document. Do that, do that. That is him answering you. He's inviting you. And you are ignoring him. Hmm. Well, he gave me two simple prayer points for us. Prayer points of prayer. I'm too tired of praying. Eh? If you are tired of praying, you have fired God. And you have hired Satan. You have said, God, or go. Satan, come inside. And I don't think you want that. Satan ought to be afraid of your house, man of God. Because of you. He ought to look and say, ah, Mr. So-and-so lives here. He will tell the demons, don't enter there, don't enter, don't enter. Just keep going, go to that other house. Uh, they're always sleeping. Go there. This one, not they sleep. I don't know what's going on. But not the one that he'll say, ah, go, go. They're always sleeping. Go and have fun. Church, let's rise up in the place of prayer. There's too much land to possess. There's too much for us to take. For us to sit back and chill. 
and I watch people fiddling with phones in service. Every time when I stand at the back there, I'll see people checking their phones in service. In an atmosphere where anything can happen, where Jehovah Blessing. You, you carry phone and you are checking maybe Instagram or posting something. Can that thing not be posted later? When you have chosen Facebook, instead of your faith book, you will live a fake life. And we are living fake lives. You want to pray? <laughs> the first prayer point is a prayer of repentance. In any way that I have failed my destiny. Brethren, you can fail your destiny. Esau failed his destiny. In any way that I have failed my destiny, shortchanged my own destiny in the place of prayer. Baba, Eshanumi, forgive me. Oh God, I repent today. In any way that I have failed my own destiny, this is not where I ought to be. And it's not because God is keeping me there. It's because I will not pray. It's because I will not press. That's why I'm there. I ought to be more by now. I ought to be higher by now. I ought to be married by now. It's not God who is keeping you. I ought to be employed by now. It's not God who is stopping your employment. You won't press in the place of prayer. And you expect God to do something you have not authorized him to do. No, he's not a thief. Cry out to God. In any way that I failed my own destiny. Failed the destiny of my children. Please, Father, have mercy on me. Forgive me, my God. Forgive me. Today I repent. I repent, Father. I repent. Lord, I repent. I will pray. I repent. God, please have mercy on me. Have mercy. I know myself. There are areas where I failed my own destiny. I know I ought to be more than what I am today. I know I ought to have gone farther than where I am today. I know it. Nobody needs to tell me. I don't need a prophet to come to me and say, well, Emeka, you are behind. No, I know. I know. And that's because I failed my destiny in some places. Sometimes when I ought to press, I'll go and play. But those days are gone. Those days are gone. I have to recover lost grounds. I have to recover lost grounds. So I have no time to waste. I have no time to dilly-dally. I have no time to play. I have to recover lost grounds. I have to pray my children into their destiny. I'm not going to let their destinies be wasted by Satan who's a waster. No, they are my investments. God's investment in my home, it will not be wasted. It will not be wasted. I'm not going to be sleeping when I should be tarrying. No, 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 no. No, I don't need anybody to pray for me. I'm going to pray. Lord, I repent. I repent, God. In any way that I failed my own destiny, Please forgive me, Father, today. Forgive me, Father, today. Forgive me, forgive me, help me. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Seven days praying in tongues for one hour. It's not a big deal. What is supposed to be, it's you when you come to church. And this is why I get concerned about people who come to church today. They won't come tomorrow. They come next week. They decide the other week, hey, my family, is somebody is doing baptism somewhere. I have to go. When you come to church, what you do is you bring your stick and you put it in the fire. Because there's fire here. So you bring it, you put it in the fire and you carry and go. But when you stay away from the fire, what happens to your stick? The fire goes out. That's why the, we gather. That's why the Bible says, oh, forsake not the assembling of the brethren. It's a place where we put this thing together and it's ignited. I can now go out with that fire and I come back so it doesn't go down. I put it out, I put it in again and it gets fired. But then I go, stay away. So that seven days, these seven days is not to, to whatever, hey, this is a big deal. No, it's to ignite the fire so that you can now get on with it. It can gradually become an inferno. In fact, the Lord told me that in the month of June, you are going to do a birthplace of glory. We are going to have a six-hour time of praying in tongues. By the grace of God. By the grace of God. And the theme is birthing glory. It's a perennial encounter that you birth your glory. I don't care if you come. Listen, I've made up my mind. If it's going to be me alone praying, 
Brethren, I don't need a crowd to pray. God doesn't need me to come with a crowd for him to answer me. I come alone, he's going to answer me. So if you like, don't come. But I will be there and I will press because there is glory that is awaiting and I can't take it in the place where I'm sleeping. I take it when I start pressing. I start pressing forward and Satan can't stop me. I am unstoppable as long as the closet remains my friend. Your second prayer point and the last one. I'll pray for you. At the funeral that we went to, at a point, the people who were surrounding the coffin had swords. And so they said, brethren, draw your sword. And they drew their sword. And then when they did all whatever they wanted, they said, sheath your sword. They put it back. And the Lord reminded me of that. And then he reminded me of David's warrior. Do you remember David's warrior? Who held a sword in his hand and fought, holding his ground. After fighting, the Bible said what? The sword stuck to his hands. He held on to the sword. He stuck to his hands. He defended his ground. Brethren, we have grounds to defend. Grounds that the enemy wants to take. And so the Lord said, you bring out your sword, you draw it, you don't sheath it till you see me in glory. It's when I see my father in heaven that I salute and I sheath my sword and say I'm home. Yes, sir. But you don't sheath it while you are here. You, don't, you draw and it sticks in your hand everywhere you go sword drawn. Why? We're in the territory of the enemy. You are going to pray. And I want you to pray this prophetically. You will draw your sword. And say, Father, today I draw my sword in the place of prayer. And I will not shield it till I stand before you in glory. It's not going back. I draw it and I will not shield it till I see you in glory. Lift your voice and say, Father. Father, I draw my sword today in the place of prayer. And I'm not going to shield it till I see you in glory. I will stand my ground in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and pray. Make this a bold prayer. I draw my sword today in the realm of the spirit, in the place of prayer, and I'm not sheathing it till I see you. That sword is not going back inside. It's stuck on my hand everywhere I go. Sword drawn at every point in time, ready for battle at every point in time. So drawn in the name of Jesus. That's how I walk. That's everywhere I go. So drawn in the name of Jesus. A watchman that does not sleep all their peace day nor night. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen, <laughs> Amen to that. My fear is that people hear this kind of message that the Holy Spirit brings and then they have a rocket repentance that has a short shelf life. Oh, for the next three days, five days, you're on fire. Hey, pra, pa, 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 pa. It has to be consistent. Lift up both hands. I'm going to pray for you. What I'm praying for is that the fire that God has put in us today that it will never be put out. Yeah. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, yeah. Daddy, before you today, I stand on behalf of your children, and Daddy, we repent in any way that we have shortchanged our own destiny by not being people of the closet, by not being people of Peniel, by not being people who tarry, Oh God, have mercy on us today. Father, I'm asking Lord, every lost ground, help us, every one of us, to recover in the name of Jesus. Every city that the enemy took from us, help us in this season to recover it in the name of Jesus. Lord God Almighty, we have drawn our sword. Sword drawn, just like the captain of the host of the Lord that Joshua saw. Sword drawn. Ready. It's not going back inside till we see you in glory. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus, the fire that you have lit in our hearts today, that fire, oh God, will burn in the place of prayer all the days of our lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And in this month of shouts of hallelujah, Father, in your mercy, let no man, no woman, no child lose their inheritance of shouts of hallelujah in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and ask them, are you going to pray?